Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as many of you know, my name is Joe Del Russo. I'm a trustee with the Bar Association, and I'm also helping to handle all of our education aspects. Um, and Karen and I have put together a, a program today. I think that um, certainly family law practitioners and and criminal law practitioners will find helpful. And, and anybody who really um, is in the field of advocacy and conflict resolution. Um, and our speaker today is Victor Veith. Victor is a uh, colleague of mine and a longtime friend. And um, I first met him in 1999 when I went out to San Diego, California to be uh, trained in the Child First Finding Words interview protocol. At that time, it was a nascent program. And, and Victor had, um, established a collaboration with the Corner House Training Facility in Minnesota. And at that time, he was with the National District Attorneys Association and the American Prosecutors Research Institute. Um, and, he, and he arrived there from, I think, Cottonwood County in rural Minnesota, where he was a prosecutor and, and um, established his name rather quickly as one of the leading experts on child welfare and child maltreatment and its intersection with the criminal justice system. Um, and from that point on, from his uh, establishment of Child First Finding Words, he became a, a leading um, advocate for children, uh, not only in uh, his area of the country, but throughout America. And his um, reach spans not only the US now, but he has trained professionals all over the world, including Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, uh, Colombia, Japan, and um, uh, other uh, places uh, that have embraced uh, a progressive response to child maltreatment and child welfare. Um, he is now the Director of Education and Research for Zero Abuse Project, as I said, and up there in Minnesota and throughout the country develops long-term strategies and develops programs nationally and internationally. And obviously he's, he's, he's well in demand. And today's subject matter, which um, I'm hopeful you all find interesting and, and helpful in your practices is um, trauma, but specifically trauma in male victims of sexual exploitation and other uh, trauma that male victims experience and its impact on them as children and more importantly on their development as adults. Without any further uh, discussion, let me give you a victim. Thanks, uh, Joe. Good to be with you. Good to be with so uh, many uh, old friends from uh, New Jersey. Sorry, I can't be there uh, in person, but uh, uh, virtually, uh, hopefully will work out uh, well also. The subject at hand today is trauma, and the goal uh, is uh, uh, to make us trauma-informed lawyers or advocates. Um, and uh, uh, with a particular sensitivity to what is unique about boys and how boys experience trauma and how uh, armed with that knowledge that it can influence uh, uh, our advocacy for these youth. To that end, toward that goal, chat a little bit about the role of the prosecutor and the child protection attorney in advocating uh, for uh, children generally and boys in particular. Uh, what do we know from the research is the impact of trauma on the medical and mental health of a child? Joe mentioned ACE research. We will uh, cover that for a few minutes, as well as additional trauma research on children who have endured emotional abuse, neglect, or witnessed uh, violence in the home. And then we'll focus on what, if anything, is unique about how boys may experience a trauma. We'll look at some studies saying the boys are more reluctant to disclose a history of trauma than our girls. They tend to delay for a longer period of time. And what does that body of research tell us uh, as to why that might be? We also know from some academic studies that boy and adult male victims have access to fewer resources than do female uh, victims. And we do know that uh, most boys, when they've endured trauma, fit into multiple categories of abuse, which often uh, makes the impact of trauma worse. They are what the researchers call poly victims. And as Joe mentioned, uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, baseball. I'm a huge baseball fan, so excited for opening day a few days away. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about Mickey Mantle and R.A. Dickey, two uh, uh, men who played uh, baseball in New York. And they're really good case studies to bring alive some of these studies. We'll see from United States Department of Justice uh, data that children who commit sexual offenses, 93% uh, of these children are 
boys. Well, if it's true that most uh, juveniles who commit a sexual offense are male, why might that be? What, what again, is uh, uniquely going on in the brains uh, of these boys that may contribute to acting out in sexually inappropriate ways? A commonly ignored uh, topic uh, is the research on the spiritual impact of trauma. And in some settings, such as the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church, the primary victims, 80%, were boys. So what does that research tell us? about the spiritual impact of being abused by a faith leader and how can that in turn impair your physical and mental health. We'll talk about that and then we'll uh, talk about good uh, advocacy for those of you who are attorneys. What does good medical care look like for boys of endured trauma? What does good mental health care look like? What does good spiritual care look like for these survivors? You uh, may work with forensic interviewers. What would be unique about how boys experience trauma that forensic interviewers should take into account when they speak with a male victim of abuse? And because of the long delay in disclosure, some studies say the average boy delays disclosure for over 20 years, we may not be able uh, to get these children into the system quickly or easily. Uh, we may deal with them as adult uh, men, but there are still things we can do in their childhood uh, that are building resiliency in them, that are serving as a buffer against these high A scores. So we'll uh, wrap up chatting about that. I was a co-editor of this uh, manual published by the National District Attorneys Association, Investigation and Prosecution of Child Abuse, in its third edition. We, through a Zero Abuse uh, Project, are developing a new uh, trial uh, manual, so look for that, and the new manual will be absolutely free. You'll be able to download a, a, a PDF, so look for that on our uh, website and social media platforms. Uh, but nonetheless, I was part of this uh, project, and we discussed in this book that the job of the prosecutor is not just to sit behind a desk and wait for uh, pieces of paper to come into their inbox and then review those documents and decide if somebody should be charged criminally and then go off uh, to trial uh, and prosecute the offense. That is just one part of the job. A bigger part of the job, a more important part of the job, is to get into your car, or to get out into the community, to make uh, connections, not just with uh, law enforcement and social services and medical and mental health professionals, but the community as a whole. The job of the prosecutor is to be a community leader, to bring the community together to respond to instances of trauma. And that includes engagement in prevention initiatives. We often forget the Children's Advocacy Center movement was started by a prosecutor a man named Bud Kramer who said, I want to bring the whole community together to have a more trauma-informed response to child maltreatment. And in some parts of the country, we've gotten away from that historic role. The job of the prosecutor is much broader than filing a criminal charge. What does that mean? It means in the context of this uh, particular workshop, the prosecutor really needs to take a leadership role in coordinating a community response to the abuse of uh, boys. We need to make sure that male uh, victims have trauma-informed medical and mental health care. We need to be able to explain to a judge or another trier of fact, what does the research tell us about how trauma impacts the brain and the uh, well-being of boys? And how do you take that in, into account in service plans and the like? Are these mitigating uh, factors? Uh, jurors may be really confused why a boy delayed for a long period of time their disclosure. We need to be able to explain through an expert witness uh, that uh, research that can help uh, the jurors understand that. Sometimes a boy is in a forensic interview will make an empowering statement. I had a case where a boy was tortured by a man and during the forensic interview, the interviewer says, well, what happened next? And the boy said, well, he came into my room to tie me up under that bed. I kicked him in the groin, and I punched him in the face, and I drug him over uh, to the window, and I pushed him out the two-story window, and he bounced like a bumble, uh, bumble. And I thought, good riddance. Then I just went to sleep, and that was a big mistake, because then I woke up, he had me tied up, and he did all those horrible things to me. Now, nobody would truly believe that this six-year-old boy could beat up that six-and-a-half-foot, 285-pound uh, man. But if we look at the research on how boys experience trauma, we know the number one uh, worry is, I do not want to be labeled weak. I do not want you to think of me as weak. And so they tend to, as little kids, make empowering statements in forensic interviews. And if we can't explain that to the trier of the fact, the judge or jury uh, may think the victim is not uh, credible. That's the power of research and why it is we need to understand it and explain it to triers of uh, facts. 
And then how do you prepare a boy uh, for court uh, if the little guy or the older uh, boy or adult uh, male is terrified of talking about these things in uh, open court? What would be a good approach? So for all those reasons uh, and more, uh, this workshop is relevant to those who work with male uh, victims. It's helpful to remember who it is that typically abuses children. It is typically mom and dad. It is typically in the home. If we're looking at neglect cases, 100% of the time it's mom or dad or their significant other. Uh, sexual uh, or uh, psychological abuse, 93% of the time the offender is a, a caregiver. 91% of beaten kids, it's mom or dad who beats them. Even when we get to sexual abuse, 60% of the time the perpetrator is mom or dad more likely dad than mom. But even if you go outside the immediate family uh, unit, it is still often in the extended family. It's grandpa, it's an uncle, it's uh, an older brother. Uh, uh, I think of uh, uh, Josh Duggars and cases uh, like uh, that. And that is part of the explanation uh, when we look at the research on boys that causes them to delay. We know, though, that abuse in the home often uh, uh, leads to abuse uh, outside of the home. If, for instance, we look at the research on trafficking in the United States, over 90% of trafficked uh, children were violated multiple times in their own home. Many of them were reported into our child protection systems, but for one reason or another, we couldn't collect the evidence to document that they were being uh, maltreated or we had weak service plans or otherwise didn't address the underlying trauma. And then as the kids got older, they simply uh, ran away uh, and then it's tough out there uh, uh, on the streets and many of these children ended up being uh, trafficked. I get frustrated when policymakers say, let's pour another $50 billion into uh, trafficking. Sure, we should uh, care for the kids that are being trafficked, but if we really want to stop trafficking in the United States, the source is abuse in the home. All right, with that backdrop, uh, what does the research tell us about the physical and the emotional impact of trauma? And then what, if anything, is unique about how boys experience trauma? Way back in 1998, Vincent Fletty was overseeing a major weight loss control program in San Diego, and he noticed something in the program that was shocking to him. He noticed the men and women in the program who were doing the best at losing weight were also the quickest to drop out of the program and rapidly regain their weight. In fact, they would regain their weight at a level he previously thought was physiologically impossible. He just didn't know what to make of that finding. So he began to study the backgrounds of these patients, and what he learned is all of them had endured significant childhood trauma, and unconsciously, and in some instances consciously, they were overeating as compensation. Yeah, 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 I know it's not good to overeat, I know obesity creates health risks, but it's also soothing, it's also comforting, it takes my mind off my pain, it gets me through the day, it gets me through the week, it gets me through the month, it gets me through the year, it gets me through my life, and now you, Dr. Folletti, are taking away my only coping mechanism, and so I had to drop out of your program and rapidly regain my weight. As a result uh, of that finding, Dr. Uh, Fletty and his research partners had what they called an epiphany. We came to recognize that in the context of everyday medical practice, the earliest years of infancy and childhood are not lost, but like a child's footprints in wet cement are often lifelong. He was so intrigued by the uh, finding in the obesity clinic, he said, gosh, if there's a clear uh, correlation between obesity and childhood trauma, what else is there a correlation with? So he queried 17,000 men and women participating in an HMO in San Diego. It was a solidly middle class population. You can't look at the ACE research and say, oh, I wouldn't have anybody like that in my community. It was a cross section of the country. The research has now been replicated in all 50 states and more than 450,000 adults with very similar results. If you work in an urban community, if you work with a high percentage of low uh, income uh, families, uh, the numbers you're about to see on the screen go up uh, from here. Uh, but think of these numbers as a base level of trauma. And depending on the demographics you work with, it may actually be higher in your community. He asked these patients, as a boy, as a girl, were you psychologically abused? Did you have a parent who said to you things like, you're stupid and ugly and fat and I wish you were never born? 11% said, yeah, that was 
very much a part of my childhood. 28% said they were beaten. And he clarified, you were hit so hard that there were manifestations of the blows on your body. There were bruises, there were cuts, there were broken uh, bones. You could see the slap mark on your face when you looked in the mirror. More than one out of four said they were beaten to the point of an injury. One, uh, more than one out of four women and about one out of six of the men said they were sexually abused as children. And he clarified, this wasn't you're walking through a park and somebody flashes you. Somebody actually touched your genitals or forced you to touch their genitals. Massive levels of trauma, he discovered in the ACE study. 13% grew up in a home where their mother was beaten. 13% knew what it was like to see mom with eyes that are blackened or she can't get out of bed in the morning because her ribs are so sore because of the beating she endured the prior evening. More than one out of four grew up in a home where somebody was addicted to drugs or alcohol. Six percent had somebody in the family go to prison. Seventeen percent had somebody hospitalized for a psychiatric condition. About one out of four were not raised by both of their biological parents. Ten percent were neglected physically, which is not a result of poverty. That would be a different issue. These parents had the financial means to do so, but purposefully, willfully, consciously withheld food, clothing, shelter, medical care, other necessities from their children. 15% were neglected emotionally, which is different than emotional abuse. Emotional abuse is proactive. You're ugly. I wish you were never born. Emotional abuse means you grew up in a home where nobody said, I love you, care about you, you're special, you're a really great kid. How would trauma of this nature impact the child's medical and mental health? Well, to assess that, he uh, said, well, if you fit into one of the categories, uh, such as physical abuse, that means you have a, uh, a, a score of, as, as one. It didn't matter to Fletty if you were beaten one time or 20 times. If you simply said you were beaten, you had an A score of one. If you fit into a second category, such as, such as sexual abuse, again, it didn't matter to him uh, whether you were sexually assaulted one time or 20 times by one person or five people. If you simply said you were sexually abused, now you fit into two categories and you had an A score of two, and so on and so forth. So you could have anywhere from an A score of zero, meaning you didn't have an adverse experience in any of the 10 categories, or an A score as high as 10, meaning you had at least one adverse experience in each of the 10 categories. If you simply had an A score of one, and it didn't matter which of the 10 categories you fit into, he found that throughout your life cycle, statistically, you were more likely to suffer from hundreds of medical and mental health conditions, including things we would never think of being correlated with child abuse, things such as cancer. Now, why would cancer be correlated with childhood abuse? Well, there's a couple of reasons. A trauma changes the development of your brain. It weakens your immune system. Every day, all of us are uh, developing cancer cells, but for most of us on most days, our immune system is protecting us. Well, if you had a high ACE score, uh, your immune system would be weakened and you're more susceptible to disease, including cancer, or heart disease. You're more likely to have a sexually transmitted disease, liver disease. You're more likely to smoke, to abuse alcohol, as we mentioned, to suffer from obesity, to be dependent on drugs, to be an IV drug user, to engage in early intercourse, to be pregnant before you leave high school, to suffer from numerous mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, hallucinations, disturbances in your sleep, disturbances in your memory, a tougher time controlling anger throughout your life cycle, more likely to be either a perpetrator or a victim of domestic violence, a tougher time holding a job throughout your life cycle. For those of you who are attorneys, do you know any client who suffers from these conditions? If so, maybe we need to shift from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, what is driving these particular behaviors. This is if you had an A score of one. If you had an A score of three or more, you were off the charts. So let's dig a little deeper. In terms of psychiatric disorders, 10% of men, 18% of women diagnosed with depression have an A score of zero. So certainly you can suffer from mental illness and not have endured trauma. But look at what else Folletti found. 54% of women, 36% of men diagnosed with depression have an A score of four or higher, significant levels of childhood trauma. And the numbers for men is probably uh, worse. Uh, we know from studies such as this uh, 2008 study that even when men are seen 
seen clinically for depression or other mental illnesses, they very rarely disclose trauma. Why? We'll see from studies in a minute. I do not want to be labeled weak. I do not want to think of myself as a victim. Treat my depression, doctor, but don't uh, ask me about my childhood. So the actual percentage of men uh, seen clinically for depression is probably uh, a much higher trauma score. In terms of health risks, uh, 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 all the major contributors uh, to death uh, have a strong correlation with trauma. If we look at smoking, 5% uh, of smokers have an A score of zero. So yeah, you're 16, somebody dares you in the back of the schoolhouse to have a cigarette. You do it, you kind of like it, it becomes uh, 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 an addiction. But that's not the norm. 95% of smokers have an A score of at least one and 16% have an A score of six or higher. So what does that mean if you're working with a teenager who uh, is smoking a pack a day? It means that no matter how many scary lectures you give about, uh, oh, uh, the health risks, or maybe they'll have to put a hole in your neck or you have an amputation, uh, none of that is going to work if the reason they're smoking is to reduce their anxiety. At some point, we have to shift from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Do you work uh, with uh, lawyers with anybody who's an alcoholic? Well, 2% uh, of the alcoholics you work with have an A score of zero, but 98% uh, have an A score of at least one, and 16% have an A score of four or higher, significant levels of trauma. You need to make sure as you advocate uh, for your client that in a chemical dependency tr treatment program, they're screening for uh, trauma and they're able to treat uh, trauma otherwise once they get discharged eventually, when they need to reduce their anxiety or they're feeling sad, they'll again go back into a bar. You're working with a teenager in juvenile or civil child protection court or family uh, court, and part of the issue is they're promiscuous. They're hooking up with two, three different uh, people uh, every week. Your lectures about uh, the dangers of pregnancy or sexually transmitted diseases uh, is just not gonna work. If the reason you're having sex is because for those 15 minutes or however long it lasts, it takes your mind off your pain. 93% of children having sexual intercourse before 15 have an A score of at least one, and more than one out of four have significant A scores of four or higher. Medical disease uh, uh, of all forms goes up. Uh, the more trauma that you have endured, uh, uh, the risk of heart disease goes up if you have an A score of one in any of the 10 categories. Again, that's because we engage in smoking or other coping mechanisms that increase our risk for certain uh, diseases. But even if we isolate our contributory behaviors, again, trauma changes the development of the brain. It weakens our immune system. We are more susceptible to disease. We pay for it, we just pay for it on the back uh, end. Dr. Fletty says, we don't really have a health care system, we have a sick care system. Hey doctor, I can't sleep at night. Oh, we got a pill for that. Uh, doctor, I feel anxious all the time. I've got a, a pill uh, for that. Doctor, I just, I feel sad a lot. I have a hard time getting out of bed uh, on time and getting uh, to work. Oh, I got a antidepressant uh, a pill as well. We treat the symptoms of our illnesses, it's a sick care system, Dr. Fletty says, it's not a health care system. We need to shift from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. And uh, if you have a high A score of six or higher, on average, you will die 20 years younger than a child who has an A score of zero. What would happen if we were more open talking to our patients and our clients and our community members about trauma? Uh, Dr. Fletty at Kaiser did exactly that, where uh, they would do a pencil and paper screening for instances of trauma. And if you filled out a form and said, yeah, I was uh, sexually abused as a child, then when Dr. Fletty uh, saw you, he would say something like, oh, I see you were uh, sexually assaulted as a child. How do you think that may be impacting your health? I don't know. Uh, why do you ask that? Well, we know from research it could impact your health in multiple ways, and so we need to be aware of that. And if it is impacting your health, there are, are things we could do. Simply having that conversation, even without making a medical or mental health referral, was improving apparently the health of these patients. A huge uh, reduction in hospital visits in the next year, as well as emergency room visits and hospitalizations. Now, why is it that just being honest and open and talking about this might influence our health? We don't know, but Dr. Fletty's clinical impression was 
There's a therapeutic benefit to having your deepest, darkest secret shared with another human being, and that other human being still treats you kindly. He gives the anecdote of an elderly woman who disclosed for the first time a history of sexual abuse by her father, and he uh, does the conversation we just went through. And the next day she writes a letter and says, I cannot tell you how much that conversation meant to me. My whole life uh, I've gone uh, around with the belief that if somebody knew what happened in my childhood, they would look at me differently. They would treat me uh, differently. Plus they never believed me because my dad was such an upstanding member of the community. So I was all alone all these decades. But you, Dr. Fletty, you just matter-of-factly discussed this with me. You uh, uh, gave me information of how it could impact my health. You gave me uh, resources and it made it clear that you were open to continuing the dialogue. And because of your kindness, I look at the world today in a completely different way. I wish somebody had had this conversation with me when I was 13. Very consistent with ACE Research is a body of research from the University of Hampshire, New Hampshire called Poly Victimization. David Flink Finkelhor and his team looked at 11,000 documented cases of abuse. And what they discovered is a child who is abused in one way is almost always abused in multiple ways. Specifically, two-thirds of maltreated children fit into at least two categories of abuse, and about a, th a, a third of maltreated children fit into uh, five or more categories of abuse. That was one important finding. A second important finding was, in terms of ACE characteristics, behavioral symptoms that you as a lawyer might pick up on, it's more strongly correlated to the number of categories categories of abuse you fit into as opposed to the number of times you're abused. What on earth does that mean? Let's say in juvenile court you're working with two uh, maltreated children, Billy and Molly. Both Billy and Molly have been maltreated three times, but there's a difference. Molly over here has been sexually abused three times. Billy over here has been sexually abused once, emotionally abused once, and beaten once. Although both Molly and Billy have been maltreated a total of three times, because Billy fits into three different categories, he is more likely to be running away from home. He is more likely to be truant from school. He is more likely to be flipping over a desk in the classroom or being defiant of his uh, school teacher. He's more likely to struggle at nap time in the first uh, grade. He is more likely, as he gets older, to become a juvenile uh, delinquent. So when you see these behaviors, you have to think of the possibility of trauma and the possibility of trauma in multiple categories. Don't ever fall into the trap, oh, the child I'm working with, uh, uh, they only endured neglect or they only endured emotional abuse. That's not as bad as being beaten or sexually assaulted. That is not supported by research. The ACE research found that any of the 10 uh, categories was increasing your risk for poor outcomes. And this American uh, Psychological Association uh, study found uh, that for children who endured emotional abuse or emotional neglect, it was just as bad and in many instances is worse uh, in terms of the short and long-term impact on children than being sexually or physically abused. With that background, what then is unique about how boys may experience trauma? They're raped, they're beaten, they're emotionally abused. Does it impact them differently than it does girls? The answer from a number of studies appears to be yes. This study, for instance, looked at boys uh, who endured maltreatment as children, and they discovered that when boys were sexually abused, it was rarely an isolated instance. Uh, more than half were abused five or more times. Uh, more than 56% uh, the abuse went on longer uh, than a year. 61% uh, the uh, anal uh, portions of their body or their mouth were penetrated. And 40% of the time it was violent. Force uh, was used in the sexual assault. And a lot of boys uh, who were uh, uh, sexually abused also uh, separately endured violence. Either they were beaten or they was witnessed uh, their mother being uh, beaten. So many of them were poly victims, and the most common occurrence was sexual abuse and physical abuse. In this study of 3,200 men, about a quarter were beaten as uh, children. Remember, the ACE research found 20 
uh, eight percent uh, of adults were beaten as children and about a third of these beaten children were violated in at least one other category and again the most common co-occurrence for boys is physical abuse and sexual abuse and this study found that if you were beaten and raped and emotional abuse was accompanying it I'm beating you because you're the devil's child. I got to beat the devil out of you. I'm sexually uh, assaulting you because you're just you're 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 just such a, a horrible kid. I wish you were never born. That that made uh, the physical and sexual abuse all uh, the worse. I was part of a team that investigated physical and sexual abuse in Christian boarding school from the 1980s, uh, and person after person, and almost uh, all of them, not all of them, but most of the victims were, were men, they would tell me, you know what, I can get past the beatings my broken bones uh, have mended, I can get past the rapes because I just think these people were crazy, but I've internalized what they said about me. I am ugly, I am fat, I am stupid. That's what I see when I look in the mirror. That's the hardest part for me to get over. It made the abuse worse and in those instances uh, harder to overcome. How often do maltreated boys access uh, mental health care or medical care? Well, in terms of mental health care, they are less likely uh, to access these services than are uh, female victims, at least according to this uh, body of research. Many men just don't want to go to a therapist. Uh, I don't want to admit uh, that I uh, was weak, uh, or at least I don't, I'm terrified of being labeled uh, as a weak uh, person. Uh, we might cover something that's a trigger. I cannot allow myself to cry in front of you. I'm a man. I need to uh, tough it out. I can get through this on uh, my own. And unwittingly, or purposefully, or uh, callously, some service providers uh, uh, still buy the old notions that boys are not quite as impacted as our female victims. This is a really interesting study from Kaiser Permanente, uh, where they talked to men who were sexually assaulted as children, and they documented how into adulthood virtually none of these uh, men uh, wanted to go uh, to a doctor if they had prostate or other issues where their genitals or anal portions of the body would be examined because they knew it would be uh, a trigger. It's an extraordinary uh, study to take a look uh, through. Uh, here's some of the men that were interviewed in the study. Uh, this victim of sexual abuse as a boy said, with my last heart attack, I almost didn't call 911 because I was so scared they'd put uh, a, a catheter into my groin. I told my cardiologist of the problem. When I was on the table in the operating room with uh, Valium and morphine, somewhere deep in my brain, I realized there was a needle stuck in my groin. Um, I, I start to flail about on a full-blown panic attack. The doctor calls for a crash team. They have people hold me down while they administer restraints, and they get, get an anesthetist to put me completely under. I wonder if there'd been a, a more trauma-informed response, could they have uh, uh, avoided this particular reaction? This is another victim in that Kaiser study. This man says, I went to a urologist due to prostate symptoms. I couldn't find a woman urologist that would see a man. I told the urologist about the sexual abuse when I was a child, but he just didn't get it. He told me to drop him, meaning pull my pants down when he wanted to examine me. When he did the digital rectal examination, I winced because of the discomfort, and he makes this crass joke, and I didn't even buy you a nice dinner. Is that a trauma-informed uh, medical approach uh, to uh, a male victims of sexual assault? Of course not. But we are often trauma-informed when we work with women because we know a large percentage of women were sexually abused. And so uh, the Kaiser study says there's a ton of medical literature out there. When you're examining a woman's uh, breast or the vaginal uh, area, you need to be sensitive because there's a good chance many of them uh, were sexually assaulted as children or adults. But we don't have that sort of literature for male victims, even though one out of six of them were sexually abused as children. We need to change that. Later on, we'll talk about what trauma-informed medical care would look like. This uh, is one of several studies that reached the same conclusion, finding that boys, when they are sexually assaulted as children, they delay the disclosure much longer than uh, do uh, female uh, victims of abuse. So in this study, they talked to men who delayed for a long time, and they said, what kept you quiet for so many decades? The number one answer was weakness. I do not want to be labeled a weak. In our society, boys are supposed to be tough. They're supposed to be strong. Uh, think of the uh, boy uh, torture victim I told you earlier, who during the forensic interview says, yeah, I kicked him in the ground, punched him in the face, I pushed him out uh, the window, right? 
And of course, we know that couldn't possibly be true. But what he's saying to our team is, please don't think of me as weak. Please don't label me a weak. I have a friend uh, out west who prosecuted a priest for sexually abusing a number of uh, boys. The boys were all men when the government discovered the crimes. And these men all told the detectives, yeah, I was six, I was seven, and the priest took me to a, a shopping mall and there were hidden quarters and he sexually assaulted uh, me. Well, the case ends up on the desk of the prosecutor, and she knows it's not true. She knows uh, that the mall didn't exist when these uh, victims were uh, five or six. Instead, they had to be 15, 16 years of age when they were being sexually assaulted. So she called the detective. He says, you're right. I can't believe I missed that. He goes and re-interviews the men. Most of them back down. Most of them say, you're right, I lied. But don't you see, detective, why I had to lie? If the word gets out that, you know, I was 15, 16, and I just froze, I wet my pants, I couldn't call out, I didn't know uh, what to, to do. You know, I was the captain of the junior high football team back uh, then. Uh, people uh, are never going to uh, accept that I just uh, froze. I, I, I could have pushed them away. I just didn't do anything. I just uh, I did whatever the priest uh, asked uh, of me. Even today, I'm known as the toughest business negotiator in this community. I cannot afford, uh, for the sake of my business, to have the word get out that I was a teenager when I was sexually assaulted. We need, as lawyers, to understand that dynamic when we work uh, with these uh, clients and be able to explain that to triers of fact. A second uh, factor identified in this and other studies, a lot of the victims said, I, don't want, I didn't want to be labeled gay back then. And a lot of things could be going on here. Maybe you're not gay and you don't want the label. Maybe you are gay and you haven't told your parents or uh, others uh, yet. Uh, if you've seen the movie Spotlight, there's this poignant moment where uh, the reporter, Sasha Pfeiffer, is interviewing this man who was sexually assaulted by a priest. And the man says, look, I was 14. I knew I was gay, uh, but I knew the church would condemn me. I knew my parents would freak out. They were pretty conservative. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what uh, uh, to do with my sexual orientation. And then I'm alone with this priest. And he says, look, it's not wrong to be gay as long as it's in a loving relationship. And then he touches my knee and he's touching my groin. Then my body betrays me. I get an erection. Uh, soon I have an orgasm and it's icky and I'm freaking out. And yet it kind of feels good at the same time. And now when it's done and I get home, I already couldn't tell my parents I'm gay. And now my first sexual experience was the hands of a man who's a priest that they adore who the heck's going to be in my corner? Who's going to believe me, right? Where am I supposed to turn now? I think I'll just keep my mouth shut. I was at a conference before the pandemic, and a man came up to me after this workshop, and he told me that he was a gay and married to a man in a committed relationship. But he says to this day, he doesn't tell anybody uh, in his community that uh, when he was in uh, a high school, he was sexually abused by a male shop teacher. Because he said, Victor, if I tell people that, then for the rest of my life, there'd be a whole bunch of people I intersect with who would say, oh, uh, Johnny's uh, gay because he got raped uh, in high school. No, this victim told me, I was raped in high school and uh, I'm gay. One didn't cause the other, right? We would never say that of a female victim, but we do say it of male uh, victims. So these and so many other dynamics we need to be aware uh, of. Another dynamic, a lot of these victims said, look, it wasn't on mom and dad's radar screen that I could get sexually assaulted. Oh yeah, they were worried about my sister when she started to date. But when I started to go out on the town, it just wasn't something they thought was possible. And then when I'm out on the town and I go into a bathroom and there's this creepy guy in there and he pushes me into a stall and has his way with me, there ain't no way I'm telling my parents when I get home. They would never uh, have understood that sort of thing. So victimization for boys and the way is it exper it's experienced by them, it's not better or worse than it is for girls, but it is different. There are different dynamics in play we have to be aware of. And the boys in this study, on average, delayed 20 years. There's a more recent study finding the delay was 21 years. Now, this is not 20 years until you call the police. It's 20 years until you tell another living human being. Think of the scandal at Penn State. It was one victim, if my memory's right. And then detectives started to knock on the door, and then they find other victims. Matthew Sandusky flips on his adoptive father during the trial and tells the prosecutors he was abused as well. And then other victims came forward only after there was a convict, uh, conviction. 
Another reason some boy victims don't talk about it is, if they're sexually abused by an older girl or an adult woman, our society says, you ain't a victim at all. It's your lucky day. What on earth are you complaining about? This is deeply ingrained in American culture. You may be old enough to remember the summer of 42 starring Jennifer O'Neill. It's critically acclaimed a motion uh, picture based on a novel, which, by the way, is rooted in an actual case. Um, but in any event, it's really depicting the sexual abuse of an adolescent boy, a character named Hermie. And it's set in World War II, and, and there's this woman played by Jennifer O'Neill, and her husband is off in war. And uh, uh, he's got a crush on her, and throughout the movie, she's deflecting his innocent crush. But then he comes over to her house to do chores, and she just got the news her husband's been killed uh, in combat. She's understandably distraught. She's been drinking. Uh, she starts to play music, dances with Hermie, takes him by the hand, and engages in sexual relations with him. Then at the end of the movie, Hermie comes over and and uh, she's left behind this uh, note. And the gist of the note is we shared this tender moment, but it can't happen again. You're a boy, I'm a woman. But I want you to know you're an amazing uh, boy. One day you'll be a terrific man, a great uh, husband and father. And you're left with the idea, what a great growing up experience for this child. Now you get it. Uh, I assume probably all of you get it. It is not an excuse to the sexual abuse of a boy to say, oh, my husband just died. And if we reversed the scenario and the perpetrator were male and let's say the man's wife just died in a car accident, you would never say, oh, well then have a drink or two and play some music and go out and sexually assault an adolescent girl. But we do say it when the victim is a boy. The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman technically isn't de depicting a crime. He just graduated from high school or college, I forget to which. But it certainly is an imbalanced uh, relationship as um, uh, uh, his uh, a neighbor uh, uh, seduces uh, him. And yet the AFI regards it as one of the 100 greatest motion pictures of all time. It too is a critically acclaimed uh, film. It's even worse than that. We make jokes about it. This is Deborah Lefebvre, who, uh, of course, stood trial, was accused of sexually uh, abusing a teacher in her class, excuse me, a, a boy in her classroom. And, and this sort of crime was fodder for late night comedians such as Jay Leno, who quipped, where were these teachers when I was in school? Imagine in your part of New Jersey, there's a teenager who's being sexually abused by a female uh, teacher. And you hear jokes like this, do you honestly feel like you can go to the police or social services or your parents or somebody else for help? Our society says you're not a victim at all. It's your lucky day. What on earth are you complaining about? This is the reality of boys being sexually abused by older girls or adult women. I'm a huge baseball fan, so I read a lot of baseball books. And here are uh, two baseball uh, books that highlight what the research is telling us. Mickey Mantle, of course, Hall of Fame ball player from uh, New York. R.A. Dickey, not as famous, but he did win a Cy Young Award when he pitched for the Mets. Jane Levy wrote a critically acclaimed biography of Mickey Mantle, trying to figure out what made Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle. And she discovered that as a boy, he was sexually abused. Me, uh, with the translation of this message, and who is? Thanks, bye. Okay, remember to go uh, on, uh, on mute. Um, um, uh, 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 discovers that he was sexually assaulted by a lot of people uh, as uh, a boy. Uh, he was uh, sexually abused by an older half-sister, by a neighborhood boy, and by a female teacher when he was uh, an older uh, child. So Jane Levy says this violates every taboo of society, familial, gender, and professional. Consistent with ACE research uh, and research on trauma uh, of boys, it was impacting uh, him, uh, though. Uh, she has an anecdote, uh, older in life, he's been drinking, he is in a bar, uh, and uh, people are talking about how strong Mantle is, you know, you could hit a home run with one uh, good arm, and Mantle says, stop, you're all talking how strong I was, I wasn't strong, uh, people had their way with me, they sexually assaulted me, I just froze, I didn't know what to do, I was nothing but a piss-ass sissy. What did the research say was the number one reason to keep boys quiet? These feelings of weakness, you now see them come to life in uh, uh, Mickey Mantle's adulthood. Consistent with the ACE research, he couldn't develop uh, healthy uh, friendships, and he knew it. Uh, here's a quote from Mantle. I just can't get close to people. I destroy every relationship. I'm weird. There's something wrong with me. 
Jane Levy says Manto's story is consistent with a cl cluster of symptoms often seen in survivors of sexual abuse. Sexual compulsivity, extreme promiscuity. Manto would have sex with everybody if they were breathing. He abused alcohol. He abused drugs. He couldn't regulate his emotions. He'd be happy-go-lucky one minute and losing his temper the next. A schism, she writes, between the public I image of Mickey Mantle and the very private Mickey Mantle. Why didn't Mantle get help? Jane Levy writes, American culture leaves no room for men to see themselves as victims. If they're victims, they're just not men. Nowhere would it have been more essential than to hide these feelings than in a major league locker room. R.A. Dickey not as famous, but when he was eight years old, uh, his single mom had a new babysitter, and on the first day she babysat, this 13-year-old girl sexually abused R.A. Dickey. And when the abuse is all done, he writes in his memoirs, I feel discarded like I'm a piece of trash. She acts as though she's mad at me, as if I hadn't followed her orders properly. I lie on a bed by myself, wondering if what just happened is real. I am still trembling, still sweating. I feel paralyzed. My limbs are leaden. She has her way with me four or five times that summer and into the fall, and every time feels more wicked than the time before. The venue shift to the bathtub and other places. I try to cover my private parts with bubble bath, but it just doesn't work. With every encounter, my goal is simply to get it over with as quickly as possible. Every time I know I'm going back over, the sweat starts to come back, my mouth gets dry, I sit in the front seat of the car next to my mother, anxiety surging in me like a hot spring. I don't know if my mother notices. I never tell her why I am so afraid. I never tell anyone until I am 31 years old. What did the research say was the average delay for boy victims? 20 years. A more recent study says 21 years. R.A. Dickey is actually above uh, the average, delaying the disclosure uh, until he is 31 years old. I keep the secret, he writes. I keep it all inside, the details of what went on beneath the hot, sticky sheets of a Tennessee summer, of the orders and the odor and the hurt of a little boy who is scared and ashamed and believes he has done something terribly wrong. He just doesn't know what that is. Mahatma Gandhi said, we must be the change that we seek. Can we all agree, whatever your job is as an attorney or another a professional, can we all agree for the sake of the boys in our uh, communities that the next time there's a high profile case of a boy being sexually abused by uh, an older girl, an adult woman, and we hear somebody making jokes like the Jay Leno quip or were these uh, teachers when I was in school, we will not let the moment pass. We will say, excuse me, but the sexual abuse of a boy is just as bad as the sexual abuse of a girl. And we know from research in common sense that if a victim overhears comments like that, it's already really hard uh, for them to make an outcry. You've made it that much more difficult. Please don't say things like that again. Can we all agree to do that? I was part of this project, at least I uh, was invited to uh, working uh, groups. The United States Department of Justice had over 50 national uh, experts, and they published this document. They updated every three years. It's an extraordinary uh, resource you should all be acquainted with. Make sure you got a lot of uh, paper, though, before you hit print, because there are several hundred uh, pages here. Half of the report is focused on, on adult sex offenders. The other half is focused on juveniles, children uh, who've committed sexual offenses. And then they just do a summary of the research in various categories. So here is chapter two, etiology, just a fancy word for cause. What, what causes juveniles uh, to commit sexual crimes or have sexual behavior uh, problems? And since at least measured by those kids we uh, catch, 93% uh, of them are boys, that's a really relevant inquiry. Why would so many uh, uh, boys uh, commit sexual offenses, offenses as children? This is the answer we usually gravitate toward. We say, oh, uh, oh, excuse me, that slide's coming up. Uh, how prevalent uh, is this particular offense? Well, juveniles comprise more than a quarter of all sex offenders in the United States, and about a third of all uh, sexual abuse of children is committed by other children. Who does it? Who commits uh, sexual uh, assaults as children? Well, uh, this Finkel horror analysis said 5% are younger than 9, 16% younger than 12. You see this spike in adolescence. 
Now, what's going on in adolescence? You're going through puberty. So if I wanted to prevent uh, juvenile sexual behavior, I think I would really target uh, adolescence and really make sure I'm covering uh, my, my, my boys uh, in my community. And then 46% are 15 to 17 years of age. Again, 93%, uh, at least those who get caught, are boys. 7% are girls. It's certainly possible we have more female offenders. We're just not uh, catching them. But right now, measured by who gets caught and has a delinquency charge, it is overwhelmingly boys. All right. So why might uh, boys commit these offenses? This is the one we usually gravitate toward. We say, oh, uh, that boy must have been sexually assaulted himself. This study found there is a correlation between your own uh, sexual abuse and your sexual uh, misconduct uh, as an adolescent or teen. But the study also found that it's not just any old sexual abuse. It's sexual abuse that begins at a very young age. It goes on for a long period of time, and there's no meaningful intervention. Now let's connect the dots. If it is true that boys delay their disclosure much longer than girls, 20 or 21 years, depending on which study you uh, look at, and, uh, and it's true that even if uh, they do see a mental health provider, provider, they're less willing to talk about their own histories of trauma, therefore less uh, uh, able uh, to access quality care. And if it is true that there are fewer resources for boys or men, then it might uh, be part of the reason we see more uh, boy uh, juvenile sex offenders than we see uh, girls with sexual behavior problems. Statistically, though, this is a, uh, a stronger correlation. The study found that uh, uh, being beaten as a child was a stronger predictor uh, of you engaging in sexual misconduct as an adolescent or a teenager. If that is true, why, why might that be? Well, we know from the ACE research, a lot of kids get hit. 28% uh, uh, of children are hit to the point of an injury. We also know that boys tend to get hit more often than girls. If, for example, you look at school corporal punishment in the 19 states where uh, paddling is still uh, practice, most of the boys who get uh, paddled uh, excuse me, most of the children who get paddled are uh, boys, and many of them uh, uh, have already endured trauma in their own home. I mentioned that boarding school case uh, earlier. Uh, I talked to a man in that case who told me how uh, he and the other uh, boys were lined up for whatever infraction they committed in school that day, and the teacher had a big paddle, and he would physically uh, strike all the boys, and he wouldn't stop hitting them until they broke down and cried. And so they all had a pact. Who could go the longest without crying? And he said, we always admired this one boy because no matter what, he would never give in. He would never uh, cry, not so much as uh, getting misty-eyed. Uh, and then this uh, victim, as I was interviewing, said to me, and you know what? He was the first one of our group to commit suicide. And then he became very emotional, and I'll always remember him saying, I guess in the end, he wasn't that strong. Remember the research uh, on boys. I'm just not going to be labeled weak. I'm not going to let you uh, 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 think that I'm a victim in any way. And not addressing uh, uh, that trauma, not being aware of those dynamics, increases the risks for really bad outcomes. What else do we know uh, about harsh uh, discipline? This study published in Child Abuse and Neglect in 2013 uh, found that kids growing up in harsh uh, disciplinary homes, even if you're not breaking their bones, even if you're not sending them to the hospital, but you're just harsh. So you're standing in line at McDonald's and your uh, little kid's not moving quick enough for your fancy, so you just push him down. Or you're at the playground with your five-year-old and they get under your skin, so you grab them forcefully by the arm, you whack them on the butt a few times, you push them back into the fray. Nobody watching, much less the kid who just got hit, has any idea why you're physically striking them. That's how they were defining harsh discipline in this study. And they found that kids uh, uh, growing up in a harsh environment like that, as they got older, they were at ele elevated risks for cardiovascular disease, arthritis, obesity, a history of family dysfunction, and a number of mental health disorders, all consistent with ACE research. We also know that kids who get hit a lot, uh, it changes the development of their brain. So this uh, study, uh, they looked at what's going on in the brain of kids uh, during uh, corporal punishment. And they looked at only kids who were getting hit on the buttocks. So no uh, blows to the head here. They, they were excluded from this study. 
these kids were hit on their buttocks, but it was a lot. They were getting hit at least once a month for three or more years, and some with uh, belts or other instruments. And they noticed a clear correlation uh, between a high level of corporal punishment and the loss of gray matter. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, but gray matter uh, may have a correlation to your IQ. It may have a correlation to your ability to control your behavior. So again, let's connect the dots. If it's true that boys get hit uh, more often than uh, girls, um, uh, uh, and if it goes on for a long period of time, that may reduce the part of the brain they need to control their behavior. They then uh, are an adolescent. Their hormones are uh, raging. They kind of know they shouldn't touch uh, sexually their younger uh, sister. But that part of the brain uh, that allows them to say full stop has been diminished can't really say for sure, but that might be another reason we see more boy than girl offenders. We also know from uh, this and other studies uh, that uh, both boys and girls who engage in sexual uh, misbehaviors, many of them come from very dysfunctional homes with high degrees of physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect, all consistent with both ACE and polyvictimization research. This was a study on adult men in prison as convicted sex offenders, and they did an ACE screening, and they found that more than half of the men had an ACE score of four or higher, significant levels of trauma in their childhood. Gosh, if, if one or more advocates could have figured out uh, what was going on in their lives as children, could we have prevented them from becoming adult sex offenders? This is often uh, ignored, and yet there's a pretty a meaningful body of research. We know uh, that being sexually uh, uh, abused as a child often has a spiritual impact, or other forms of abuse uh, does as well. Many offenders incorporate religion into the theme uh, of the abuse, or even if that doesn't happen, many victims just have spiritual questions. I pray and I pray and I pray and I ask God to stop the abuse, but the abuse keeps going. Uh, so what does that say about me or God or uh, both? All right. How might this pertain to the abuse of boys? Well, if we look at uh, the scandal in the Catholic uh, Church, uh, we know uh, that 80% of the victims were uh, boys. Uh, many of them were uh, uh, adolescents uh, or uh, uh, older. So often the media says these are pedophile priests. Well, actually they wouldn't be if, <laughs> if they're abusing an, an adolescent. Uh, so the media often doesn't understand what we are, are talking about. But nonetheless, the John Jay Criminal Justice uh, College uh, did two uh, reports about the history of sexual abuse in the uh, uh, church, uh, and they determined that 80% of the victims were, in fact, uh, boys. What do we know about boys abused by clergy? This is a really uh, great book, uh, book by Michael D'Antonio of the history of the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic uh, Church. Uh, and of course, one of the uh, famous uh, uh, or infamous uh, priests is Father Murphy, is the subject of New York Times articles and uh, a documentary called Mia Maxima Culpa. And we know one of the things he would do is he'd call a boy into the confessional, or maybe it was a closet, but he would liken it to a confessional. And he would say, God has asked me to seek uh, teach you sex education. He would abuse the boy, and they would say things like, you're not allowed to talk about it. It's uh, protected by the sacrament of the confessional. If you talk about it, you could lose the grace of God. There could be eternal consequences uh, to you. And we know other priests and other clergy have often communicated those sorts of things to their victims. Well, if that happens, how would the uh, child be uh, impacted? This was an American Psychological Association Literature Review published way back in 2009. And at that time, there were 34 major studies involving the abuse of more than 19,000 children. Additional studies have been published since then. But study after study has found that most, not all, but most victims uh, of abuse are impacted spiritually. Let's just look at one study so you get a, a flavor of the research. This was a study on 527 victims of abuse. Some were physically abused, some sexually abused, some emotionally abused, many all of the above because we know from ACE and poly victimization research that when you're abused in one way, you're often abused in multiple ways. Every child, every single child in this study was impacted spiritually, which manifested itself in feelings of guilt, anger, grief, despair, doubt, afraid of dying, a belief that God is unfair. What does that mean? Let's go back to that uh, boarding school case. 
I interviewed a man who said, you know, I'm just sort of wondering, Victor, does God have an, uh, does God, uh, uh, have an understanding of ACE research? And I said, tell me about that. And he said, well, I guess what I'm asking, Victor, is, is you know, does God really get it? Uh, I was beaten on this compound. I was raped on this compound. One day they pulled out a tooth without a Novocaine. All my friends were beaten or raped. My best friend uh, took his life on this compound. So I get it. I got an A score through the stratosphere. And that no doubt explains why, as a young man, I became addicted to drugs or uh, alcohol. It explains uh, probably why uh, I was unfaithful to each of my wives. It's like I, I, I wanted the marriage to fail. But the worst thing I ever did, Victor, is I killed somebody. I was high on drugs across the divider line in a highway. I accidentally struck another car. I took another man's life. So they sent me to prison for criminal vehicular homicide. Well, I'm out of prison. I got a pretty good job. I've been clean from drugs for a year, but I'm really scared. I'm really scared of dying because if I die tonight, how does God sort out my life? Do I get a pass? Does God say, yeah, you did a lot of horrible things, including killing a fellow, but you also had a really miserable childhood. So I'm going to look the other way and on you can go into heaven. Or does God hold me accountable for my many and great sins? Miami, Miami. That's a spiritual injury. I interviewed a woman who said she was sexually abused by a doctor. And the doctor said, you're so lucky, you're so special. I could touch sexually any child in my care. But I purposely selected you because of all the adolescent girls I'm working with, your breasts are the most developed. She told me she developed this tremendous anger toward God. God is all-knowing, so God must have realized that if my breasts grew early, uh, this man would be attracted to me and would violate me sexually. At the end of the day, she said, I'm just so angry at God. Interestingly, though, this and other research has found, although uh, you may uh, be uh, impacted spiritually from the trauma, you may grow up and say, I want nothing to do with organized uh, religion, it doesn't mean you're no longer spiritual. One man told me, uh, I'm never doing it, Victor. I'm never going back to church. I think church is just the cover for the abuse of children. But every morning I get up really early and I pray and I read my Bible uh, before I go into the office. And I said, tell me about that. Tell me about praying and reading the Bible. And he said, well, I don't know why I do it, Victor. I guess after all these years, I'm still searching for something. Viktor Frankl said, it is not suffering that is unbearable, it is suffering without meaning. And for many victims of abuse, they're trying to make meaning of their suffering, and spirituality is a part of how they do that. Unfortunately, that's often the part of them that has uh, been the most impacted by the trauma. This uh, study is... Uh, uh, predictable. It reflects common sense. But this uh, study found that if the person who abuses the child is a priest, a rabbi, an imam, uh, a pastor, closely connected to the child's faith tradition, the impact on the psyche is more uh, pronounced. In this study, they talked to clergy uh, men, and they said, what's going on in your brain when you were sexually assaulting children? And the men said, well, I'm basically a good person. I'm always giving blood to the Red Cross. I'm always serving soup at the homeless shelter. When there's a natural disaster like a tornado, I'm among the first on the scene to help those troubled souls. And all the good things, all the good things I do in my life overshadow the teeny tiny problem I have that I touch some children sexually. Now, these cognitive distortions were bad enough, but then researchers and clinicians have asked these offenders, do, do you communicate uh, these ideas of yours to the victims? And the answer is all, all the time. Uh, the John Jay study uh, uh, interviewed a number of priests, and they would say things like, a child came unto me, God wanted me to act out uh, uh, sexually with this child, I was teaching the child sex uh, education, it was good for the child, I got them past their stutter, or whatever the issue may have been. And when this happens, these children, as they grow up, they truly want nothing uh, to do with organized religion. Their relationship with God, this study uh, found, ceases to grow. Interestingly, the impact on your spirituality is greater uh, depending on the age when the abuse begins. 
Not really sure why that is, but uh, some believe, you know, you're five, you're six, every part of you is developing, including your sense of spirituality, your connection to a higher power. And if that's when the abuse begins, it's like you're stuck in a moment in time. Now you're 14, you're 15, or 16, and then the abuse begins. You've got more spirituality in the wheelhouse, uh, more of a buffer uh, against uh, the trauma, and so you may not be as uh, spiritually impacted uh, if the abuse uh, goes later on in life. Obviously, each victim's different, but that is a general observation. If we address the spiritual impact of trauma, dozens of studies say uh, this may be the most important source of resilience. Uh, this may be the most important factor in improving uh, the child's condition in the short and long term. Here's one of a number of studies that bear uh, that out. The study found that those uh, victims of abuse, both boys and girls, who figured out how to uh, turn to their spirituality in a positive way were doing so much better than those who were unable to do that. And here are some of numerous studies that reach very similar conclusions. John Hopkins did this uh, massive uh, study finding that adult victims of abuse who maintained a healthy uh, connection to their spirituality even if there was never meaningful medical or mental health uh, interventions, they were doing a whole lot uh, better uh, in responding to their high A scores. They still may be impacted, but the impact was muted. The American Psychological Association recognizes this phenomenon. They have published not one, but two treatises for mental health providers to utilize when working with victims of abuse or other trauma. And they say in these treatises, go ahead, use cognitive behavioral therapy or EMDR or other evidence-based approaches. But within that framework, for those victims for whom it is important, there's plenty of room to explore their spiritual questions. This 2017 study documented how often in forensic interviews or MDT investigations, sexually abused children were raising spiritual questions. Am I still a virgin in God's eyes? Questions along those lines. And they found that some CACs are just ignoring it. That is not trauma-informed uh, uh, practice. Some CACs were saying, well, kids Jewish, I'll get a rabbi. Kids Catholic, I'll get a priest. Kids uh, Protestant, I'll get a minister, and so on and so forth. Sometimes that worked out uh, well, but it was sort of luck of the draw. Do I really have a trauma-informed clergy person or not? And so the researchers said, we have got uh, to do a better job here. We have to dramatically improve the knowledge of our child protection professionals about this body of research. We also have to dramatically improve the knowledge of faith leaders about what trauma-informed spiritual care would look like. And then we got to get faith leaders in the same room with the other professionals and teach them uh, how to coordinate medical, mental health, and spiritual care. One of the things uh, I'm very proud of uh, is we have helped now six accredited children's advocacy centers implement a chaplaincy program. The very first was in Greenville, South Carolina. This is Reverend Carrie Netto. She used to work as a pediatric chaplain, so she already had skills of working with kids who've endured trauma. Maybe they were in a car accident, their parents, uh, parents uh, perished uh, in the accident, uh, and she had worked with kids uh, like that. So she already had a lot of uh, skills and met uh, board-certified chaplaincy uh, credentials. Well, then we uh, provided her additional training to be a CAC uh, chaplain, and she became the nation's first CAC chaplain. It's just a service. Nobody is required to access it, sort of like chaplains in the hospital or military or police chaplains. They're just a service uh, out there. Last year, 535 children or adult uh, family members asked for the services of the chaplain. The other thing that Carrie does is she gets out and about in the community and she educates other faith leaders about what trauma-informed spiritual care would uh, look like. So if she's working with a victim and needs to make a referral, let's say the uh, child is Baptist, she wants to make a referral to a Baptist minister, she won't make a referral to any old Baptist pastor. She'll find somebody uh, who's been trained uh, in trauma-informed care and knows how to coordinate that spiritual care with the medical and mental health providers at the CAC. It is a promising practice, and we're working with uh, two prestig uh, prestigious researchers to document the efficacy of the model. Again, at least six CACs that I know of uh, now have either a full-time or part-time uh, chaplain because the research says we need to address this. 
We also need to improve mental health care for boys. Uh, this study found uh, even in a clinical uh, setting, uh, many men uh, just didn't want to label themselves uh, as uh, abuse uh, victims. Um, and it was really hard for them to disentangle multiple forms of abuse uh, in these uh, clinical settings. So uh, one thing we can do is if we're talking to uh, a male a victim in a therapeutic or other setting, don't ask a question such as, were you sexually abused as a child? They'll often say no. Instead, you might ask the sort of question that was posed in the ACE study. When you were a boy, did anybody touch your genitals or force you to touch their uh, genitals? As a boy, were you ever hit so hard that you had injuries? That's harder to ignore uh, and is more likely to result in helpful information. If you're working with a boy or a, a girl who uh, has engaged in sexual misconduct and is in juvenile court, we do know that treatment can have uh, a positive impact. So look at this uh, data taken from the Samapi report. They looked at uh, kids, most of them were boys, uh, who were adjudicated delinquent for having committed a sexual offense as an adolescent or a teenager. They measured recidivism at both a 10 and 20 year interval, uh, comparing boys, who, mostly boys, who went through treatment with those who uh, did not. And, and look at the results, whether it's another sexual assault charge, another violent charge, but not of a sexual nature or any charge at all, as simple as you know, stealing a Snickers bar from the local gas station. However they measured it, at both the 10 and 20 year intervals, those kids who went through an evidence-based treatment program were doing a whole lot better uh, in the short and long term. So there is hope uh, for these kids if we advocate for evidence-based treatment uh, programs. What sort of treatment programs should you be advocating for for these children? Well, again, go to the Samapi report, look at the uh, chapter on evidence-based approaches so that you're recommending something that actually may make a difference. Cognitive behavioral therapy has been proven to be effective with both uh, children uh, and adults who commit uh, sexual assaults. Um, this uh, uh, analysis uh, found that multi-systemic therapy, where we keep the child in their natural environment but pour services into their church, into their home, into the uh, schools that they're at, uh, may be the most effective. Now that's also the hardest to do and sometimes you can't do it uh, if the uh, victim uh, uh, is in the same home with the uh, offender. But if you can do it, it seems to be the most effective. We also have to work with our doctors. Again, those of your prosecutors get out and about, work with your medical providers. Give them that Kaiser study that I referenced earlier. We need to be more sensitive when we work with boys and uh, men. And so that Kaiser study said, if you're a prostate uh, doctor, one out of six of your patients were sexually uh, violated as children, so be sensitive uh, to that. And just as you would working with a, a woman examining her breasts or vagina, you'd be trauma-informed. And as part of uh, taking history, uh, you might ask, hey, any traumas in your childhood I should be aware of that might be uh, triggers during the uh, exam. And if they uh, want to share with you uh, a part of their history, uh, stop taking notes with your pencil or typing things into the laptop. Make eye contact. Truly listen. Truly be engaged with your patient. Do they have a preference for uh, the gender uh, of the doctor who'll be examining them? And if so, talk about uh, that. If they indicate they're afraid, uh, they know their selves better than you do. So say, hey, um, tell me more about your fears. Uh, what can I do to alleviate your anxiety? I remember I had an invasive procedure where I'd be awake and they said, do you like music? And I said, yes. And they said, who's your favorite artist? I said, Johnny Cash. They played Johnny Cash music during the whole 90-minute uh, uh, procedure. It was very uh, 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 soothing uh, to me. Little things like that we need to be proactive in uh, doing. And if the procedure is invasive, invasive, let the patient know that unless they're put completely under, they can always say a no at any time. They still have uh, some power. Men in particular are terrified of losing that uh, power. Help them anticipate stressors. Now I'm going to touch you here. Now I'm going to put uh, 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 my fingers or my hand up, up your rectum uh, so that they can anticipate and prepare themselves for what you're about to do uh, next. 
and then explain uh, to them uh, procedures for undressing or uh, touching. Uh, tell them exactly why you're touching them in the intimate parts of the body. Because if you don't uh, tell them, the trauma brain of theirs will often go to, oh, uh, you're doing uh, 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 something here just because you're getting your jollies uh, out of that, right? Tell them why uh, you're doing something that's invasive, uh, particularly to uh, uh, the intimate parts of the body. Let them know if you're going to ask for positioning that might be a trigger to traumas they endured in childhood or another point in their life. And then during the procedure, take a sounding from them. How you doing? You're doing okay? Uh, anything I could do to, to, to help you? Uh, uh, be engaged with the patient during the procedure. For those of you who are or may work with forensic interviewers, be aware of these uh, dynamics. Boys are more reluctant to disclosures. They have this uh, fear of being labeled a weak. So simple things like reassuring them. I talked to lots of boys. Oh, I guess I'm not alone. Uh, let them know whatever happened is not your fault. Often they are told that it is uh, your uh, fault. Uh, if that kid says, I beat him up as he was torturing me, uh, say, is that what happened or what you wished uh, uh, happened? That might get them off the dime and certainly don't empower uh, uh, and ask for details of statements you know are not uh, uh, accurate. That only hurt them later on. And then if it does come up, have an expert witness to explain why a child may be making empowering uh, statements during the forensic interviewing. I want to leave you with some hope. A lot of children, especially boys, will never make an outcry no matter how often you teach personal safety or, or make other uh, steps. But many of them will grow up just fine. And oftentimes they grow up fine because of you or another adult who was caring and compassionate uh, in their uh, life. A third to a half of all uh, victims of sexual abuse grow up and they don't have the sort of ace characteristics we discussed earlier. And that's because many of them are resilient. What makes a child resilient? Well, you do. Were you supportive of them when they shared a history of uh, trauma? Did you do what you could to get them into good uh, medical or, or, or mental health uh, care, if appropriate? Um, uh, were you supportive as a mandated uh, reporter? Uh, I always tell professionals, you can't control what happens uh, in this child's life, but you can control yourself and how you respond. I always taught prosecutors, on their deathbed, every abused child will remember two people. They'll remember the person who hurt them, and they'll remember you. And they won't remember whether you got a conviction or not. They'll remember, were you kind? Did you do everything you could to advocate uh, for them? That is what they will remember. Could you get them any sort of healthy uh, a relationship with a caring adult or uh, a good uh, peer? That is building uh, a sense of resiliency. Can you do anything uh, to strengthen their family in civil child protection or family uh, court? Maybe a mom and dad are emotionally abusive and they think sticks and stones will, will never hurt my children. Can I educate mom and dad that those words are actually as destructive, if not more uh, destructive? There is research from uh, Utah that if doctors and others just educate parents about uh, the risks of toxic uh, stress, they create uh, a conversation where parents often say, oh, I don't want to do that. I remember uh, what things were like for me as a childhood. And it creates um, a better outcome and can move parents away from uh, abusive tendencies. Do your doctors do things like that? Are you engaged with your schools? Are they uh, trauma-informed? Do they even know what that uh, means? Uh, little things like, can I keep that maltreated child in uh, soccer? Uh, that's building resiliency. Why? Well, my dad says I'm stupid, and my mom says she wishes I was never born, but the soccer coach says it's amazing how I can curl the soccer ball with my uh, toe. Uh, can I keep them in a band? Uh, can I get them a caring teacher or a clergy person or Boy Scout leader, some caring adult who's a good influence in their life? That is building resiliency. Victor, uh, yeah. we, need to give a, we need to give a code to the members uh, real okay. quick. Okay, sure. Finish up, sure. So the program code is in Karen's window, it's TB29, TB29, Thomas, Bill, TB29. Write that down and you can put that on your registration form to get your CLE credits with the payment. Okay, right. Victor, go ahead, wrap it up. Yep, yep, almost done here. And and your anti-bullying programs in schools or other youth serving organizations, we also know, uh, build a sense of resiliency. Yeah, mom and dad yell a lot and they hit one another. 
but at school, we don't do stuff like that. And we resolve uh, our differences peacefully. I like school. I want to be at school. Uh, so those anti-bullying uh, programs are also building resiliency in maltreated children. And again, good health care and anything we do to uh, have safe neighborhoods, all of that is building resiliency. A couple of resources for male victims you may work with. Male uh, Survivor has a lot of good resources, and they've got uh, groups uh, around the country who uh, meet. Uh, uh, they just have a lot of good stuff. And then One in Six uh, uh, has actually been doing a lot of research working with male uh, victims. We uh, actually have a grant uh, with them on a, on a research uh, study. They, too, are a great website with a lot of good uh, resources for the male victims you may be working uh, with. I love this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, even though some academics say he may never have actually said it to him, uh, said it, but it is attributed to him. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to act is to act. Happy to stick around, uh, uh, Joe or uh, uh, Karen, if anybody has any questions. Victor, I have a question about the ACE studies. You said that they were um, replicated many, many times over the years, the yes. adverse childhood experience studies. Was there um, any among those studies, were any of them inconsistent in any way with the original study? Or did, was there any study there that um, provided a nuance that was unexpected? Uh, not to my knowledge, the numbers held pretty consistently all over the country. What is different though, that I, that I alluded to, there is a study done in Philadelphia where um, uh, the uh, disproportionate uh, number of the community members they were looking at uh, were minorities uh, and uh, were below the poverty line and they had much higher ACE scores. And, and some of that might be predictable because of the correlation of, of uh, say neglect uh, with poverty. Um, uh, uh, so think of it as a, a base level, but depending on the community you're working with, it may actually go up from there. And then let me add to that. We know that intergenerational trauma uh, exasperates a, a high ACE uh, score too. So if you're working uh, with uh, somebody in an in indigenous community or a minority uh, or a Jewish community, uh, there may be a trauma that's been passed down from generation to generation that could also be uh, in, in play when you're working with that uh, family. We need to be aware of that dynamic also. You know, you told us about Artie Dickey and Mickey Mantle, and I shared with a couple of my friends and colleagues and, and persons who have no connection whatsoever to what we do and what some of us do. And I kind of heard about Artie Dickey because he got a Cy Young more recently. Mickey's been uh, dead for a while. But no one said that they knew that Mickey Mantle was a survivor of sexual abuse multiple times as a child. And from, and I, was that the last boy? I think I read most of that book, but I don't recall when he disclosed and how he disclosed. I mean, was he in his 50s? Was he in his 30s? Uh, what, what, when did he tell? I honestly don't recall, so I, I guess we'll, we'll have to read the Jane Levy book. My, my memory is Levy was a Sports Illustrated reporter, and if my, and my memory is you know, as you say to juries, you know, check the original resource because my memory may not be uh, uh, right here. But my memory is she was a Sports Illustrated reporter and uh, a younger woman, and and she just saw odd things that he'd be happy one minute and then he'd be making advances toward her, and and that encounter kind of is woven throughout the book. I won't tell you how it ends in case you want to read it. Um, but then you know, years later, she really is trying to figure out what what made him Mickey Mantle, and so then you know she did this deep dive and and discovered all this history of trauma uh, uh, in his uh, childhood. Um, but when he disclosed, I don't recall and and I think I, I think and, and again um, I haven't read the book for a while but, but but I think some of it was just accidental like you know you're 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 saying this about me I'm not really uh, that uh, these things happened uh, to me yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the the um, the bulk of it was disclosed to the writer um, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that at all yeah. because she's someone who yeah who yeah. um, dug deeper than anybody else cared to. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised about about that yeah. at all. And, and not surprised that he was, um, yeah. you know, sexually aggressive with her either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Victor, one of our participants is asking a question. What is your opinion on the trend to allow child victims of abuse to 
remain in their homes and loading services in the home versus removal from the home with the same types of services? Um, if we can do it safely, I'd be in favor of delivering services in the in the home. The SMAPI report, for example, says with juveniles with sexual behavior problems, that's the most effective. Uh, sometimes, though, it can't be done. You may have, you know, 16-year-old boy sexually assaulted his 6-year-old sister, and they just need to be separated for the safety of the victim. Uh, but if you can do it safely, um, it's always good to keep the family together and to pour services into that uh, family. And I would also add to the safety equation, are mom and dad uh, on board? Do they need some help yet before they can uh, process uh, this, this juvenile staying in their home if they uh, committed an offense? So you got to also assess, you know, where are mom and dad and are they going to be taking out their uh, frustrations on their, their, their child? I always ask that as well. But if we can keep the family together safely, um, I think that is the most effective way to deliver services. Okay, any other questions, Karen? You see anything in the chat room? No, nothing. Victor, any parting comments? Any new initiatives you want to plug while you're here? Uh, where, where are you traveling next? <laughs> Most of our work's under a federal grant. We're under a travel ban, so a lot of our work is uh, virtual, but um, um, that may be lifted in the, the weeks to, to come. So look for me all over the uh, country. Um, but yeah, Zero Abuse Project, we're a nonprofit, uh, you know, mostly private donations and a lot of uh, state and federal uh, grants. Um, uh, befriend us on social media, get on our email website. Uh, the very topic we discussed today, we've got a brand new uh, article investigating and prosecuting cases of child sexual abuse where the victim is a boy and it's a really good resource uh, and um, it's uh, it's just gone through copy editing now we have to get approved by the Department of Justice so probably be a couple months before it's published but you know look for things like that and if you don't like if you're not on social media and you don't you know want to go and fill out a form because you just don't want our stuff delivered to your inbox then just periodically go to our website and see uh, what's the latest under a publication section or the training uh, section most of what we do is 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 free i mean i try primarily work with child abuse prosecutors child protection attorneys but most of what we do is 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 free and we've got a lot of free resources so um you use us as a as a as a resource we we work for we work for you and, and the children we serve. Well, thank you, Karen. Some wrap up? That's, yep, that's it. Thank you, Victor. On behalf of the State County Bar Association, we do really appreciate your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Thanks, Karen, for your help. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Victor, very much for All your right. time. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. Great coming on. Thanks. Thanks.